Alright, um, this is Unit 10, Ms. Howard's Chemistry, Border High School Chemistry, Gases and Kinetic Molecular Theory. This is part uh, 2.5, so it's in between 2 and 3. There, you get it. All right. so you still have to know the, um, be able to describe and calculate the relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, moles in an ideal gas. Um, you need to perform some stoichiometric calculations. You need to, involving gases and masses, you need to describe the kinetic molecular theory and understand different forms of energy. So, letter D, factors affecting gas pressure. Okay, volume. <laughs> volume, temperature, number of particles, PTV. So, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up writing PTV on like a little 3 by 5 index card. In that order, PTV. And we can use that card to figure out what happens if we change any of the factors. So, what happens if you keep the volume constant? and you change the pressure and temperature. Or what happens if you keep the temperature constant and change the pressure? What happens to the volume then? So we can use that little card to help us. So what we do is we can determine any change we need to look at if we only look at two factors at a time. Okay, the other factor then we can keep constant. So we have PTV on the card. So we put them on the index card. And then you're going to grab the letter of the factor that will remain constant. So put your thumb on like the V. And that means, oh, hey, I'm going to keep the volume constant. And if the pressure goes up, you've got the card, it's like this. If the pressure goes up, then what happens to the temperature? Well, the T goes with it. So we'll do this in class, and it'll give you a, a nice little handy visual and kinetic, kinesthetic to, uh, factor to go along with what we're talking about. Okay. I have a video for you. Let's see if it'll work. Gas is made of molecules that are far apart and small. They don't lose their energy when they hit container walls. They travel in a straight line, no changing from their course. They move faster when it's hotter. They have no attractive force. Rock me out the guy throw, rock me out the guy throw, rock me out the guy throw with gas laws. Gases that behave like this are often called ideal. Which gases are most like this, though they are very real? Hydrogen and helium, the smallest gases on the chart. High temperature, low pressure, will spread them far apart. Rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro with gas laws. Assume all gases behave like this, treat them all the same. It's Avogadro's hypothesis, they've given it a name. Equal volumes of different gas, if they have the same T and P, will have the same number of molecules of gas in each. See? Rock me on the guy throw, rock me on the guy throw, rock me on the guy throw, with gas lungs. The mass of each gas molecule is weighed in AMU. We need to turn that mass to grams, which we can better use. You need Avogadro's number. That's something that we've heard. A mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro with gas laws. Rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro with gas laws. Because we treat each gas the same, each one that's on the list. Real gases have attractive force, pretend they don't exist. We can use the gas laws with each and every one. So go get your calculator out and prepare to have some fun. Rock me on the god row, rock me on the god row, rock me on the god row with gas laws. Whether you use Paul's Law or Charles or Game Sex, you can use them on any gas. You won't get no flat. Thanks to Avogadro, we can treat them all the same. And that is why I wrote this ditty in honor of his name. Rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro with gas laws. Rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro, rock me Avogadro with gas laws. P1, P1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. Okay, so Roman numeral number five, gas laws. 
We're going to start off A. We're going to go in alphabetical order. Maybe it'll help you to remember a little bit. Start with A, Avogadro's Law. Ah, that's spelled wrong. Avogadro. The little yellow stuff. We'll ignore that. Okay, the orange one is spelled right. Avogadro's Law made it about 1811. He said equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure contain equal numbers of molecules. So equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure have equal numbers of molecules. So again, we're talking about numbers of molecules here. When you think Avogadro, always think numbers of molecules. Think big numbers. So the volume of, there it is, the one mole, the volume of one mole of gas at any, any gas, any gas at all, at STP is 22.4 liters, which we'll use that to do some stoichiometry. So if we have, in the first one we have helium, the second one we have uh, one mole, in the first one we have one mole of helium, and that means we have 22.4 liters, and you'll notice the pressure is one atmosphere. In the second one, we have one mole of oxygen, and the volume is 22.4 liters. And in the third one, we have one mole of nitrogen, and the volume is 22.4 liters. Do they all weigh the exact same? No. So even though you've got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of helium in the first one, remember, it's a mole, it's going to weigh 4 grams. One mole of helium, you can look on the periodic table and see how much it weighs. One mole of oxygen, now remember that's O2. So it's 32 grams. And then we have one mole of nitrogen, N2, because it's a diatomic molecule. It's going to weigh 28 grams. B, Boyle's Law, created in 1662. Or, I can't remember my numbers, why I wrote them down. So he's living somewhere around 1662. Boyle's Law is going to relate volume and pressure. When the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. So we're going to keep the temperature constant, and we're going to mess with the volume, and it causes the pressure to go down and vice versa. So if you look at the equation V1 times P1, the 1s and 2s are just talking here's the here's the initial or the beginning volume and here's the final or the, the end volume. So the volume initial times the pressure initial equals the volume final times the pressure final. Okay, so a bicycle pump is a really good example of Boyle's Law and there's our lovely Sir Boyle, Robert Boyle. As the volume of the air trapped in the pump is reduced, its pressure goes up. So if you've used one of those old red um, bicycle pumps, the bicycle tire pumps, when you push down on it, you decrease the volume, and it gets harder to push down on it because you've increased the air pressure. And when you increase the air pressure, it, it enables it to get in. You can force that air into that tire. Okay, now... I've got some other information here, and this is just basic human biology. The mechanics of breathing, and it's free information. So basically, you have the size of your chest cavity, the thoracic cavity, and you've got that diaphragm, that little upside-down U-shaped muscle. And when you contract that, it drops down more like an, a, an upright U-shape, and it increases the volume. So when you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure, and air automatically rushes into your lungs. Well, when you relax that, that uh, muscle, it pops back up to its spot, that, that uh, diaphragm pops back up to that upside down U, it decreases the volume, and then if you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. And the air outside is less pressurized than the air inside your lungs, and it automatically moves from an area of greater pressure to an area of lesser pressure. We'll talk about this in class again. Now, all it is, once you get inside the lungs, and if you think of the lungs, they're like, uh, they consist of little bitty tiny like little balloons, little air sacs. All it is is simple diffusion of gases once they're in there. Diffusion just moves from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. So you suck in that air, and there's lots more oxygen in the air than in your blood. And so the oxygen moves from an area of greater amount, the little air bags in your lungs, into a lesser amount in the blood. And then the CO2 in the blood at that point, there's a lot more carbon dioxide in the blood than there is in the little air bags, and so the carbon dioxide moves from an area of greater amount inside your bloodstream to an area of lesser amount inside the little air sacs, and you blow it back out. So it's just simple, straightforward chemistry diffusion. Okay, we've got some stuff on scuba diving, too. And you guys have heard before about people having the bends, and when someone has the bends, it means that they have gone down really deep, and as you go really deep when you're scuba diving, you go at a, a fairly slow descent. And what happens is you get more and more and more gas 
dissolved in your bloodstream. It takes up less space because it's more pressurized, and so it gets dissolved in your bloodstream. That means if you come up too fast and you don't come up slowly so that you can just slowly breathe the stuff back out, then when you come up too fast, instead of being breathed out slowly, what happens is the gas actually starts expanding in your bloodstream. And so you have bubbles, specifically, typically nitrogen is one of the big ones. You have bubbles of nitrogen inside. And we have a video on that in just a minute. Okay, so scuba self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Rapid rise, when you're, you're diving deep, the rapid rise causes something called the bend. And that's when nitrogen bubbles out of the blood rapidly from a pressure decrease. So when you decrease the pressure, the volume expands. Okay, so you, again, you have to rise slowly to the surface to avoid the bends. And here we have a video. Let's see if it works. Gases have no fixed shape or volume. If they are not contained by something, gases will expand without limit. But if they are put in a container, the gas molecules will spread out to completely fill the space they're in. When Sean puts an air tank on his back, it is full of the air he needs to stay alive underwater. An air tank is one of the most important pieces of diving equipment. A typical tank holds about two and a quarter cubic meters of air. Under normal pressure, that's about the same amount of air that would fit in a telephone booth. But, in order to fit that much air into such a small tank, the air must be reduced in volume, or compressed. As more and more air is forced into the tank, the molecules of air are forced closer and closer together. As a result, the pressure in the tank increases. When all that air is jammed into the small dive tank, the pressure on the air inside the tank is more than 200 times greater than normal air pressure. Despite this increased pressure, the air inside most types of dive tank still has the same mixture of gases as the air you're breathing right now, about 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. As you go deeper in water, the pressure pushing on your body by the water increases. Normal air pressure at sea level is about 100 kilopascals. At a depth of 10 meters, water pressure is 200 kilopascals, or twice the pressure of air at sea level. By the time a deep sea diver reaches 100 meters, the water pressure on the diver's body is 10 times normal air pressure. Since the air inside the diver's tank is also under pressure, the air can still come out of the tank so the diver can breathe. But breathing pressurized air brings with it the potential for serious trouble. When gases are under pressure, more gas molecules will dissolve in a liquid, such as the blood and other fluids in a diver's body. For a diver, this means that more nitrogen will dissolve inside the body. The deeper they dive and the longer they stay underwater, the more nitrogen will enter their bodies. Normally, this isn't a problem because divers are trained to ascend gradually and make several stops on the way to the surface. This slows down the release of nitrogen from body tissues. It allows the excess nitrogen to stay in tiny bubbles, enter the bloodstream, and be exhaled from the lungs. However, if a diver rises too quickly, the nitrogen bubbles expand in volume as the pressure decreases. The process is similar to opening a bottle of soda. Opening the bottle slowly reduces the pressure gradually and prevents the formation of large bubbles. But when the bottle is opened quickly, similar to a diver coming to the surface too quickly, pressure is reduced quickly. Sean Gregg experienced this rapid release and expanded volume of nitrogen bubbles called decompression sickness. Dizziness and nausea kicked in just immediately and the only thing I could say to my partner was get the gear off and get me in this boat because there's something wrong. And at which point I had made it to the ladder of the boat and that is the last thing I remember. The expanding nitrogen bubbles can block circulation or press on nerves causing the diver to bend forward in the intense pain that often gives this illness its nickname, the bends. But expanding bubbles in the bloodstream can even be deadly. In Sean's case, they blocked the flow of blood to his brain. Sean! Sean! Unconscious Sean! and perhaps seriously injured, Sean was rushed to the hospital. Along the way, Sean regained consciousness. 
but the nitrogen in his bloodstream was taking a toll on his body. The expanding nitrogen bubbles in his tissues and bloodstream were causing paralysis. You know, here you are, you know, you've, you, you've been diving all your life and no big problems, and all of a sudden one day you do everything right, and, but you're, uh, you're now going to be in a wheelchair. Sean faced never being able to walk again unless doctors could find a way to get the nitrogen bubbles safely out of his body. His only hope lay in New Zealand, an island country about 3,000 kilometers away. John Duncan is a dive medicine doctor at a hospital in Auckland, New Zealand. He uses a hyperbaric chamber, an enclosure that can simulate the higher than normal pressure found underwater to teach trainee divers about the effects of nitrogen on the body. But the main purpose of the chamber is to help people like Sean, who are suffering from decompression sickness. After Sean was placed in the chamber, the air pressure was gradually raised to a level that simulated when Sean was deep underwater. The increased pressure inside of the chamber caused the nitrogen gas bubbles to reduce in volume and dissolve back into his bloodstream and body tissues. Then the pressure in the hyperbaric chamber was slowly decreased, allowing the nitrogen gas to be released more slowly and be normally exhaled through the lungs. Finally, Sean began to move. Over the course of several treatments, the nitrogen gas bubbles in Sean's body were compressed and decompressed several times. Miraculously, the spinal damage he had suffered began to heal. Sean still has some spinal damage, but with each passing day, he regains more and more of his mobility. With more than 90% of his movement back, he's again able to do the things he loves most, and playing with his children is at the top of his list.